Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Awesome. It's all yours. Uh, I have uh, briefly introduced you, but uh, if you can just tell the audience about uh, where you're coming from, what you want to speak about. Sure. Uh, first of all, hi everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, this is exciting. Uh, it's almost midnight here yesterday for me, so I am speaking as a voice from the past to you, which is kind of fun. Anyway, um, so yeah, I am going to speak about uh, the title of my talk is Finding Yourself at Open Source. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you still see it in full screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I've been um, writing Go since about 2012, 2011. Um, and so, in this talk, by the way, this is it's going to be not super technical, um, but I'm going to discuss some of the like practical. Um, realities of working with open source and letting go um, open source code, uh, dealing with some of the community and like other aspects of open source that I've learned over the years that like, hopefully will be interesting and useful. Uh, anyway, at, just interrupt me at any time if you can't hear me or if, if something you know, happens if I can't really see anything when I'm presenting. So, uh, anyway, okay. So, real quick introduction. Uh, this is me. Those are my hands, anyway. Uh, I'm a programmer working on a master's thesis. I love a little bit about me. I love climbing. I love getting outside. Uh, so, rock climbing, indoor gym climbing, bouldering, hiking, scuba diving, fly boarding, bicycling in the rain, taking care of living things like plants. And one of my favorite things is talking about Go. Um, and those of you who are have been pretty well invested in open source, may have already found the need to find a lot of other hobbies to get away from the computer once in a while and just take a break. And in fact, you can understand why I have so many. Um, but, uh, but I do love talking about Go. I'm really excited for this. So tonight, um, it will be really interesting to go over a few elements of, um, of working in, in open source, in the Go open source community specifically. Um, some of these ideas will transfer to other organizations too. Um, again, not a super technical talk, but the theme here is, is kind of like one of discovery and learning. Um, and hopefully you can not make the same mistakes I made. Um, and ultimately just have a lot of fun. Like, so the point is to find what you like in open source. Why do you like writing it? Part of the reason is probably because it's fun. And open source starts to be fun. She is sure um, the opportunity to be a part of the community. I think this new meetup thing you've got going is great. It sounds like really awesome. Um, your next talk you know, looks a little more technical and really interesting lots of things on. So the community is like a really exciting aspect of open source. Um, but it's not, like there's a lot of elements to it. So I'm kind of interested in talking about these in particular. If you want to get into open source, you kind of work your way in or try to find your niche. Um, but hopefully some of these ideas will be useful to you. Um, so the first thing I think if you so to really think about is uh, to find a problem. Find a problem that you're interested in and that you need to solve. Um, problems are challenging and they are worth programming. So the way I think of creating problems that you need to solve or that you that you want is basically if, if something is in your head and, and if it's something that you need, or if it's something that you just want. And especially if you keep thinking of it, those are problems. And if it's not already solved, then solve it. But if it's solved, but not as well, or not in the way you would like, 
either contribute to it or um, start working on your own solution. Um, and yeah, and then really finding the right problem is, is what will make things interesting. If you find a problem that you think is boring or that you have no interest in like really diving into, if you have no interest in doing it super well, um, it's not going to be a great experience probably. Um, so I'm just trying like the first problem that someone may recommend to you, like, oh, okay, you know, this project needs some work, like, okay, look into it, but like, you know, you don't have to do that. Find something that you're passionate about. Um, for me, back a few years ago, several years ago now, um, the problem was like that web servers were difficult to configure. And um, I lived in an area that had really bad internet connectivity. Uh, even here in the US, like we have really bad internet sometimes. Um, and uh, also, I wanted websites having GPS more easily. So those are like the two main problems that I wanted to solve, and I was like, how can I work on this? That's kind of where Caddy originated, was just thinking about this problem. Um, and so as you can see, you know, this person tweeted, this was a couple years ago, they said they had like 600 lines of configuration in their Nginx uh, config file. And like, that seems like a lot of configuration to set up a couple of websites. Um, and uh, with the caddy file, with caddy, it's only a, about 100 lines at 1.6 the size. And so that's one problem that we set up to solve. By the way, if you haven't used caddy, that's okay. If you're not familiar with the project, just know that it's a web server with Nginx or Apache. Um, that should get you through most of the stuff. Another uh, problem, like I said, is bad connectivity. So, like, I have really bad internet access. This is a picture of me when I was like 14, I think. Uh, it was in my home in Iowa. And whenever it snowed, and if it snowed just the slightest bit sticky, and even if it was just a little bit, it would totally block our internet access because it couldn't, it, it would reflect on the dish, right? And so I had to climb up on a ladder and almost get on the roof and then use the room to sweep the snow off to get back online. Um, and so, kind of hated that. And then the last problem that, that really motivated Caddy was um, was that uh, like time working with HTTPS. Um, I'm sure some of you have set up sites with HTTPS before um, to make sure that your connections are secure whenever people connect to it. Um, and it's kind of a pain. You've probably gone through this process. There was a lot of steps, a lot of insecure steps, a lot of error prone steps. And that's why a lot of websites are using HTTPS, not to mention the price tag. So I knew all kind of issues that I wanted to see if I could work on solving. Um, and it was a lot of fun to work on this problem. But uh, also, by the way, I know the caddy is known for automatic HTTPS, and that's why the primary features, but actually it wasn't the initial initial motivation that we didn't get that for like a year until uh, after Caddy was launched. But um, yeah, so so once you've determined like a problem that you really want to work on, uh, the question is well, how do you need to solve it? And uh, the answer to this will be different for everyone. Um, you want to you want to think about it a lot. Get all sorts of different ideas, different approaches. Don't try and, and hammer it out all in a, a day. Um, for me, it involved a lot of pacing around my room with the workflows and talking myself, actually. Um, as if, I mean, no one will talk to me about it. So I would just talk to myself through the problem and try and find a solution. Um, and with some people, I would prefer to draw diagrams and, you know, Figured out I'm not that kind of, I just like to talk through it and I architect it kind of in my head. I think about it. It's not so much I can like think of in my head. And so at some point I need to start writing code, and that's I call that a proof. Where you just like if you sit down and you just start studying up code, I love writing no code, so this part's really fun. Um, and I just started with a new main function and I just started studying out what I wanted the caddy file to look like and and that would solve the configuration problem. It's like, it'd be really nice, you know, basically it was like, it'd be really nice if you could just open a text file and just 
like maybe you're excited when you enter, and then like just the way speech feature you might be excited to have when you say enter each time. Like, that would be so great if it was just that easy. And that's how the county class is born. Um, as far as connectivity, I don't know what I can do about that in an access and I don't, but on the web server side, um, it's, it would be really helpful if it supported modern protocols, like uh, that, that, that are faster and that, that support, you know, that connectivity. And then HTTPS, the solution, this was lucky, HTTPS isn't even, like, with, with solving that problem would be actually mostly run um, in the sense that um, when the grip came along at just the right time and it just fell right into place. So once in a while that will happen, that's super awesome, and I think you should totally capitalize on that. Um, so be aware of other things in your ecosystem or in your sphere of like, the problem space that you're working in and see what else is going on out there that might be compatible with what you're doing. Um, so oh, again, just each of the solutions kind of look like this in practice. This is what a caddy file looks like where you start the name of the site. And then the configuration is just so easy. Um, the, it's, it's easy to write, it's easy to understand. It also lends itself to the architecture of the program, where um, the first line is the name of the site, which is really what your configuration is about. So that's the focus. And then, you know, each line, the first word is like a directive or a feature. And these lend themselves really well to what later became plugins. But each feature is, each directive is a feature, uh, is a plugin, I mean which means that you can add more um, without having them being like, built into the, the main repository. So I have to write a few features and other people can contribute their own. For example, uh, this Git directive is really cool. It's the third party plugin written by Apple, who um, this, this code lives in a separate repository. And um, I specify Git and then just the path to the Git repository. Every time you do a Git push, uh, to that repository, uh, Caddy will pull it down. And uh, so if your site is finding in a good repository, you see get push into the player site. And it just takes one line in the Caddy file. Um, so things like that, super cool. And you know, setting up reverse proxy, you know, just one line of config, really, really nice. Um, or or rendering markdown files as uh, site web pages. So, so this kind of, this kind of like thinking and really stepping out like how do I want it to work? That was where the solution came about. And and um and so it's okay to like think like throw away previous ways of doing it. If you want to improve on that particular thing, throw away all past approaches if they aren't good enough for you. Put up something new and then make it happen. Make your dream kind of thing happen. Because if you know it, yeah. That's a cool thing, you can literally do anything. Modern uh, protocols, Go is a really good fit. HTTP2 uh, was emerging, and Go had a lot of um, work in that area. So um, it was really easy to, to kind of build on top of that. And in HTTP2 before other web servers, TLS 1.3 was just released actually a couple of weeks ago in, in Go and in Caddy as well. So, both of these protocols improve speed and security and um, make things more efficient when there's that connectivity. And then eventually, HTTP3, which is right now it's called Quick, will also do that. And Caddy has uh, some early support for that as well. So, so Go, again, is kind of a good and maybe lucky choice for, for solving the problem that I need to solve. And then, oh, this, uh, the HTTPS problem. Is actually one of my, is my favorite thing about Caddy. So, if you've used Caddy before, you probably have this experience. This is like the you know, the typical 28 second video that I show. Um, because if you've set up HTTPS before, but you never used Caddy, uh, this will be a new experience. This will blow your mind. You don't even need a Caddy file. You can specify the host name in a, in a command line plug if you want. But all you do literally is just run Caddy, and right there it sets up. The, uh, your channel certificates for you and redirects HTTP to HTTPS and 
like you really don't have to do anything and you get HTTPS. And that was about as good as I ever could have imagined. And again, that's thanks to um, the engineers and, and that's incredible. And um, that, that was kind of lucky. But when you get into the web server, by the way, was not easy. <laughs> it's super hard. We had a few issues we'll talk about later. Um, and no one's a web server still. Does this by the way? Not, no other web server will do HTTPS automatically and by default. You always have to like, turn it on, which I don't love that idea still because it should be secure by default. Like HTTPS is like expected. So, um, anyway, so I took any solved these problems um, that I was kind of dealing with, and it was a lot of fun to come up with those solutions. So, Okay, uh, and actually, just for comparison, this is how so, um, other web servers also can use like secret. This is an example of a video put together of how um, Apache uses like secret, and it's a little bit more involved. Um, it's still super good, and still better than the old way of doing it. But I just wanted you to see, you know, kind of what's involved. Um, and that's definitely something you have to turn on by default. So I assume you have like this, this virtual host configuration, and then you have to like turn on certificate management for that domain. Um, and then go to reload the config, and then it should be all it takes. But it's it's pretty similar, but it's just a little extra work and you have to turn it on in other web servers with some caveats on by default. So um, okay, so another fun, or not fun, part of, um, you know, open source projects and, and especially in the real world where there's a lot of uh, competition for like good names, it, it is naming your program and, and if you work in the few programs, you know, naming is really hard. Um, Caddy is no exception. I actually don't like the name Caddy, <laughs> so but we're kind of stuck with it. Don't talk about. Um, so, um, maybe the open source project is neat because you have an opportunity to, I mean, if, if you want other people to, to maybe use it or notice it, a little more, a brand can be kind of a trendy or catchy way to to, uh, to do that. If you go have a brand, you know, it needs a name, or it can be a thing. Like, like, that's kind of fun. Um, so some people like know what you're talking about, um, just because it has kind of a unique or memorable name. Um, it's actually really funny. Who was I talking to the other day? I was in like, oh, I was in the climbing gym like two weeks ago, and I like met someone brand new that night. And I it turns out he was in like some some science student, but he was in some science field, not computer science. And he's like. Hey, are you the guy that wrote Caddy? I was like, yeah. <laughs> well, you remember the name, and I guess you put my face to the name, but oh yeah, it was just the most random caption. So, so names can be important if you want to like make captions like that. Um, but anyway, so that was kind of fun. Um, so when you come up with a name for an open source project, a lot of people will try and make the names clever or like use a pun. Which is fine, but honestly, even when we're all real programmers, your, your open source project name doesn't need to use the word go in it, uh, unless it like is some description of what the project actually does or is. But like, you know, it doesn't need to say go in it. Also, we're trying to keep it professional. Like, if things and names are straight out inappropriate, and that's just really unfortunate because it makes conversation a little bit awkward. Um, so I always search go back to that word for conflict synonym, um, just because package naming is going to be confusing if you are a, like, a, a similar name. So you want to make sure it's unique, do searches for it. Um, if it's memorable and you can spell it pretty easily, that's obviously good. Um, and we're going to those pretty fast, though, the space those is getting a little crowded. Uh, even caddy is not spellable. There's a British way of spelling it, which is with an IE. So that is a problem. That is. Um, also, check for other meanings of the name. 
something to think about because it definitely seems like the source project names were in a different language. The name is insulting or offensive, or in certain cultures, it's derogatory. So stay away from those. You have to ask some people. Some of those you just don't know until you either search for it pretty you know, deeply or find people that kind of hopefully bounce for it. So, um, Craft would be a name which like the values and goals in the project. That's kind of what I was hoping with Caddy was like, oh, it's like a caddy. Like it, it kind of holds things for you and it like, takes care of all the like stuff that you don't want to have to deal with while you're like out. You know, you're, you know, you're working on your thing and then Caddy, your caddy server will really like take care of all the details that you don't have to think about. I still don't know the name, but anyways. Um, you can change the name too, so like you don't need to come up with it right away. You can change it, but if, you, if you're going to have like a launch of your project and like announce it, you can always change it before then. You can change it after, it's a little harder. Um, consider your name names and then also like trademarks. Uh, in fact, this is funny. Uh, I had a <laughs> when uh, Karen messaged me to invite me to just do this presentation. Um, I, I noticed on message history because early 2015 is actually before Caddy was released. I had a message with them, like, I think he saw the project somehow, or I asked him something about it. And uh, I told him that I was trying to decide the name, and I could, you know, this is a fine name, but and so but I almost called it a cadet. But I know a few other names that Caddy was coming up with, but I don't like any of these. I mean, I think I'm bad about Caddy, but I just thought it was funny that I did <laughs> consult with. Um, so once you pick a name, you're kind of stuck with it, especially if you like watch it. And yeah, you know, I, I kind of went all out. I just had some fun. I I wanted to try my hand to see that you know all good stuff, so I we made a website for it and um, made a logo. And you know, it was kind of practice, just kind of playing, having fun. Um, and so this is this is a few of the web pages in the Kelly website. And so if you want, you can turn your open source project name into a brand. If you, especially if it's important to you, uh, you can use it a lot. And it adds a little bit of legitimacy to it. Also, it makes it way more inviting and attractive to read about and learn about, which open source is really all about, you know, just uh, getting people interested and getting people together to work, you know, so you can really do that. Papers or in presentations, and then you know, if you, if you want to go back and change it, you can, but it's a little, uh, it's a little awkward or difficult to change, especially with you know, these papers will never change, they're immutable. So, I guess I'm stuck with the name. Anyway, um, you definitely also want to consider finding a scope, and what I mean by scope is similar to like in the concept of you know. Programming like a function scope is like what are your boundaries basically? And um, really, so many good questions to ask yourself for any kind of open source project, and uh, it is to, to find out like uh, an answer to yourself when is the project going to be done? When is it going to be like feature complete? Um, because I'd say this is like a good way of like. Caution actually, because if, if you don't set good boundaries, and especially if people start using your project, um, it can be really exciting when people like find your project useful. But it can also run away from you if you don't say to people who ask for certain features, no, that actually is not a really good fit for the project. Um, because otherwise, it can kind of bring you out and the project can also lose quality if the feature creep starts to get out of control. And so you don't want that. And, and you have to remember too, from the perspective of your users, people who requested features don't actually care about your project scope. They just want a feature that they are asking for, whether it be in your project or someone else. But if they're asking you to add it in something else, or they want to keep using ours. 
And so what we need to know, and maybe decide ahead of time, or, or at least early on, maybe people start commenting about it and giving you feedback, what you want to know is, what do you really need to contribute personally? Because you, know, you don't, again, want to bring you know, throwing yourself to the ground you know, in work, but, but you started the project because it's useful to you, but how much you willing to do just to help other people, um, you know, for free? We'll talk about that in a second too. What kinds of things you want to recommend that pull requests be made? So like you might answer a uh, feature request and like, hey, actually, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Go ahead and so submit pull requests and I can review it. Um, you know, you have to probably you know review pull requests, which is also work. Um, find out what kinds of things are you willing to recommend that forks be made? So features where that probably never be a good fit for your project. So if they want it in your project, they should probably fork the project and make their own copy of it with that feature. Um, Creating forks can be not awesome for growing projects just because it can add confusion. Uh, people are like, oh, which of these do I need to use? And if you're, if you're going for, again, like a brand or um, trying to establish a reputation, um, that, that can be a really detrimental to your project's safety ecosystem. And, and Go especially can be a little tricky with like package imports and stuff. Um, so just, just think about that. Generally, I, I try to avoid like major forks in my project, uh, but the, actually like diverge like, the long term vision. Um, so think about it, but it's okay to avoid it. Like, that's the beauty of open source, it doesn't really matter. And then what kinds of things would you disrupt them not to get at all? You know, typically you want a good reason for that. Uh, where, where you tell people, uh, that's not a good idea, whether here or in any other project, and this is why. So you are the expert for your project. No one else in the world knows your code better than you do. Uh, what's really important in this particular aspect of, of boundaries and, and scoping your project, but also later on we'll talk about like licensing and stuff, but just remember that. Like you might be new to go, you might be new to the problem you're trying to solve. But as far as the project itself goes, you're the expert. If people start using it, they don't have to like trust you. I mean learn from them, but like also you know your project better than anyone. So um like don't don't let yourself get trampled by you know endless feature requests or whatever. Uh can we skip? We, we really, I didn't know that I did this. I didn't define it first. And um, a really, really common feature request was for more middleware, or more HTTP handlers, or in other words, more ways to do things with requests, more, more features to handle requests in certain ways. And, and I was like, well, okay, this is going to, okay, sure, it's more requests. Yeah, it was, it was built with each middleware. It was like its own package, and that was really nice. So it could be added too easily, but then I realized, oh, these folks. It's going to be hard to maintain. Uh, the code base is going to get large. What is the scope of the web server? I realize that some of these requests are getting a little exotic. Um, so I invented this plugin system for Caddy to have. Super simple. I should probably give a talk about that somewhere too, just because I think it's really useful. Um, because this allows people to contribute features in their own repository without having to change anything basically in the core of CAD. Um, therefore, we have all these features and we don't have to have scoping issues anymore. CAD is a web server at its core. That's what it does. And if you want all these extra features like to get pull and push for your site from that, you can just plug that in and use it. So plugins is a great solution to that um, scoping problem. Um, and Still are struggling with scoping our documentation. What I mean by that is a lot of people have questions about how to use Caddy or they encounter problems that they don't realize is a fault with their system configuration or their environment. A lot of people using Caddy with like Docker and System B and, and stuff. And it's like, and I have to go to one, I have to go to line somewhere for because I was maintaining documentation for Caddy too. And, People say, oh, it should not be how to use it in system view or doctor. Well, okay, maybe a lot of projects do that, and you can consider that. But I've defined the scope of Caddy's documentation to be about Caddy and, 
And anything else is like, like look up those documentation. Like, you should know kind of how to use your other tools or, or look up the documentation. And we have a tutorial somewhere that like link the two, but link using Docker and Caddy. But as far as me, like documentation is it, it's just going to be Caddy. This is not a popular decision that I've made, but it is a relief to me. And because I, I don't use Docker and I don't. I'm using system B more now, but um, anyway, it was just um, it was just something I had to you know solve uh, and then just set that boundary. So anyway, if you want, this, okay, so sponsors. This is kind of fun if you plan on investing a lot into your project uh, long term and like a really like don't know about it. Sponsors are pretty cool. They're a part of your community that you want to build out. And um, especially if it's just going to be a side project, sponsors are a great way to go. Um, it's totally optional. Uh, there are many ways to and reasons to go thinking about this. I so a lot of people just sort of make a Patreon and you can like have people donate, you know, with a dollar a month or a few dollars a month. Um, for your continued work on the project, and that works for a lot of people. I've chosen not to do that because I don't, for a few reasons, I don't like, um, I don't like uh, kind of marrying my side or passive income to just this one particular vendor, which is Patreon in this case, or one particular escrow, I guess. Um, because uh, I'm subject to their rules, their policies, their uh, security breaches they had in particular, but um, so, but maybe that's all fixed. I don't know. So, Patreon is fine for some people. I just chose not to do that. So, I went the sponsorship route specifically, where um, I basically invite companies to uh, to contribute something. It could be funding, it could be some infrastructure, maybe, or, or services, or whatever. It's just they give something because they're interested in the project. And so, I think sponsorship is a really good way to boost your project's legitimacy. Um, and it allows you to get resources that you need to development, especially if it's becoming a bit of a struggle on you uh, in some way. Um, like maybe, maybe you're a freelancer or a contractor, which works really well for those who are interested for. You could be working 40 or 7 hours a week doing your freelance work, your contract work. But you can either spend maybe just 25 to 30 hours on that and, add, and spend like 10 hours a week on your side project. Well, in order to justify that financial, you need some income from your side project. And sponsorships can be a good way to solve that problem. Um, so make sure to treat your sponsors really well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's going to be a, a good part of your community. So, so if you want to get a sponsor, um, go with something, first of all, that companies find useful. Um, now, there is this question that I would ask, that I wish I asked myself earlier. But if, if you wrote something that companies find useful, why wouldn't you just sell it to them instead? So think about that. But it's something that they find useful. Maybe you don't know if they're going to find it useful. Um, hopefully, that doesn't catch by too much surprise, like it could be. Uh, I wish there was a few open source projects I wish I had sold. But, um, Sponsorships can still work out because they may not even contact you, but, but you contact them. And this is a simple way to be like, hey, like, notice you, you use this or you want to use this, or this project, you know, supports your customers. This is actually a really good angle. You can, you can say that if you notice that your project benefits a company's customers or if their customers are using your project or something like that, you can go to those companies and be like, hey, I have this project here that. And some value to your customers, you want to sponsor this project. Like, think of the big PR when your customers find out that you're in support of this project that they find useful. Um, so, they don't have a vested interest in its development, and they'll be more willing. Um, so, so, and also just make it known that you're looking for sponsors and uh, it can happen. As far as negotiating sponsorship, um, I, I, I don't know, it can be a little stressful if you're not used to it. Um, Basically, just think about this. Most of the companies will usually just want you to keep the project maintained. Um, they want to be associated with it. It's a good uh, name for them, kind of thing. Um, suggest some annual contribution. 
uh, of services or infrastructure or funding. Um, if, if you can make it an annual thing and just keep in touch with them occasionally, and you know, you want to preferably keep it like reviewed, you know, as long as you're working on it instead of just a one time thing. But when I think about exclusive sponsorships, <clears throat> if you want to, uh, if you want to aim a little higher for contributions so that they're the only ones that are associated with you and it looks a little more like a little more like a partnership, but it's not a partnership. Um, so instead of just being a part of the world of logos and your project site, they can they can have an exclusive slot. Like they are the be sponsor. Um, you know, offer them links and publicity and you know, opportunities to guest blog and any other treatment that they like want that you can give. Like offer that, and some companies may not need anything more than just a link, and, and just keep the, for you to keep it maintained. Like to that, that's usually sufficient. By the way, as far as like annual contributions, I'm not talking like you know, generally I'm not talking like just a couple, you know, hundred dollars a year or whatever. But like, it should be a substantial amount, and that's what like keeps you funded. Like if you're actually donating, currently. You know, almost a fifth of your working week. Think about what that is worth to you know a company that's an interest in keeping your project maintained. Um, so don't don't lowball it for sure. Don't let your cut your your value. Um, okay. And as far as choosing a license, okay. So this one is a little tricky. Um, and go. It's also can be difficult. Um, so check my time here. Okay. Um, so licenses are very important. And you may know nothing about licenses or legal stuff, and that's okay. I don't either. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but everyone is asking about licenses, especially companies, and no one wants to talk about them. So a pretty secret I've learned about open source, and that is that People just like getting things for free. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to insult anyone or anything by saying that, but it's basically true. Um, yes, there's like a great community spirit about open source and you know, all this and that, and you know, a lot of knowledge and growth and public you know, benefit. Okay, that, that's true, but let's be honest, like most people just use open source because generally it's free. Um, so licenses are important in that they control how your work can be used. Licenses are not a copyright. Um, you still own the copyright even if other people are licensed to use it. You just have to think about how you want people to use your work. Uh, if you don't really care, it's just like very little time investment, whatever, you can use your liberal license, like really liberal licenses. Like, MIT or OBSD licenses, which are basically just include the copyright, but you can use this for anything you want. Um, and you, so you, what you need to do is think about if you want to be compensated for your efforts now or in the future, if this project's going to grow, like always anticipate that it's going to grow, especially if you're pretty, like, you know, pretty good about it. Um, because, yeah, definitely not licensing some of the projects the most. Ideal way, I think. And, and the reason it's a problem is because uh, the growth can exceed your availability and your resources, especially if there's commercial use. It's a little stressful, trust me. It, I was a little stressed when I found out that some of my projects like Caddy and Pop Pipes and a couple others were being used by like, I don't know, the United Nations, or like, um, I found out that multi billion dollar banks in, in Europe were using it, or, or um, the Panama Canal, I think. Like, it, it's stressful when you find out that, well, actually, I also believe that there are health care uh, or um, like relief, humanitarian relief organizations using CADI for their like, services in the field. <laughs> um, to, to, to provide humanitarian relief in, in third world countries. And like, it's a little tricky when you find out that your side project is being used to help people like treat other people and like save lives and stuff. And you're like, okay, like, 
That's what we should have even earlier. <laughs> so, anyway, consider the, the ripple effects of your license choice. Um, Apache is what I've said about for Caddy, and actually, I, I like that license. Um, basically, when you're just comparing licenses, like at the high level points, you don't need to understand all the main names, but find a repeatable site that kind of bullet points the main points of the license. Um, GPL and NGPL can be a little touchy. Uh, some people don't like that, especially companies, mostly because companies are not willing to open source their own code, so they can't use your code in their code because they have to open source their code too. Um, and so GPL, so a lot of projects will GPL license and then sell proprietary licenses to companies. Uh, and that's how they get compensated, that can work. Um, there are kind of new final options that are that claim to be, yeah, you know, we're just not familiar to anyone yet. Like the unlicensed, which basically puts it into the public domain, or there's the fair source license, which uh, tries to help get you compensated on um, if it's usage grows. And then one of the clips, since I saw this recently, is kind of like a revised MIT that's supposed to be more legally uh, clear. I, I, don't, I don't know. If you use a new chain of license, they will be prepared for some companies to not use your work at all because they can't. So like, they might list it MIT, BSD, Apache, or whatever. Um, usually they blacklist GPL. So think about those kinds of things. Uh, if you don't go with a license at all, like you don't have a license file, technically, I think that means that people aren't allowed to use your code at all, like for anything. Which again, you can do it, you're right, but it's just kind of weird. And like, why did you open source this? <laughs> uh, it's also a dangerous legal precedent for companies that use your code at all if there's no license. So, um, anyway, licensing. We had a huge, um, what do you mean? You may know about this when we announced commercial licenses a couple years ago. Uh, this was our attempt to keep county open source, but sell uh, licensed binaries. To companies to use um, official, official, professional sign binaries. And even though we didn't actually change Caddy's source code license, like it's still, it's still Apache license, it's never changed. Um, it really uh, upset a lot of people. And that's why I found that a lot of people actually just like free stuff, I guess. But, anyways, this apparently offended a lot of people. And but we also were able to get some companies on board and actually were able to support them a little bit. And, and we're just a little bit, it's, it's not like I can't live off of it, but um, we've been working on that. <laughs> There's a whole long story that I won't get into. Uh, and this leads directly into finding a balance. And this is what I think I'm going to end on this note because uh, open source can be very time consuming, can be very exciting, but yeah, well, you have to find a balance. Um, I like to think about like the force, you know, for Star Wars. And there's even a quote about this in one of the recent movies. There's a light side, there's a dark side, and there's balance between it all. Um, open source is, is like that. <laughs> and it looks like this slide is unfinished or something. But, anyways, um, the point of finding balance is that you don't want to lose yourself in open source. Um, don't invest all of your time into it. Um, you should find yourself in open source. You should discover something about yourself that you maybe didn't know you could do, discover new friends, discover um, the joy of other people you know, benefiting from your creation. Like, that's all great ways to find yourself in open source. But if you start to get unbalanced in how you spend your time or in your stress levels or whatever, it's okay to, like, you have no obligations to other people. Um, and people are upset with your project for any reason, they'll, like, usually demand that you change it. I, I mean, I feel kind of bad. I was actually dealing with something like this today where a really great member of our community, um, a user of Academy, and I was upset by a recent change, and I, I totally understand that, and I, I regret the change, I think. But I don't really want to like, undo it. I don't want to change it back. And so to fix this for him, you know, my recommended change, my recommended fix was for him to configure it a different way. So because rather than me change my project, because I didn't want to take a step backwards and undo the change because I thought it was a 
last session we haven't even changed even though we regretted making it i wanted to do it before you know we get stable 1.0 like, i had reasons for it and so if you demand, you know, if you're upset and you demand change, it's like it's okay to, to reject change, especially if you can help them fix it on the punches for that on their end. Um, open source, you know, ultimately, like, it's a hard problem to, it, open source is itself a problem uh, in that it's economically unbalanced. It really is just funded by goodwill. Um, and so, even if it has financial funding, like, once it has enough to like sustain you, it, it's basically funded by good will. Um, the county project threw me out of balance. So I don't know if you've followed its history at all over the last few years, but you know, it's, it's been really fun to see it grow, and it's been a really great project. But and, and a few major incidents, I even handled them pretty well, I think, um, mostly. Uh, what happened though is that maintenance were just got way too demanding. And when I was full time in school, I'm still finishing my master's degree. Like right now, I'm actually at the lab working on my thesis. Um, but like, I also, you know, had paying jobs that like pay bills because open source doesn't for me. And so, in an attempt to change that, I made licensing changes. Well, the community got kind of upset about that, and they misunderstood a lot of it too. Like, I was a little upset that they actually, I was a little disappointed that they responded that way. Because I, I know that they were better than that. Like, I knew how awesome the community was. And many people still were great, by the way. There's just a few, like, people got really sour, but kind of ruined it. And then people really excited. Like, I noticed that Cavity's growth really, like, hit off. And, like, it really, it, it slowed down. And so, um, it's taken me about two years to realign myself, like, to get myself back into balance. And I'm still working on it. And a lot of those hobbies that I was showing you earlier, but if we see all those pictures, they help a lot because it kind of gets my mind off the um, So the camp community, by the way, is still really great, but it's just this couple of, you know, these couple of, uh, and by the way, anyone I show who like issues, you hear as examples are not from the sour. <laughs> um, and so uh, here's an example of an issue where uh, once encrypt went down for I think it's like a day or half a day. Um, this was a while ago, like a couple years ago. And Ken, for some people, would not start where they couldn't get, well, because they couldn't get certificates. Um, and I think I handled this issue pretty well. It unfortunately happened right on the day where I was like, I was submitting a paper to to a so machine learning conference, like, and it was due the next day. So I was like working all day and night on that paper. And um, my initial response was, yeah, I read the issue, I accessed it, and I said, it's actually working with the sign, but like, you need to fix the problem, and then you had to start. Not a very popular response, as you can see. Uh, then we got to the front page of Hack Reviews. Because uh, I guess a lot of people experienced it, which, oops. Um, I had to clarify a lot of misunderstandings, so many misunderstandings between this and licenses and other things. So many misunderstandings, really unfortunate. And communication is by far one of the hardest things uh, in the first project. Um, but I, I spent a couple of hours, even when I showed my work on my next paper, and I fixed it while I worked around the issue in some way by making Teddy behave a little differently, at least. And this was more positive than we see. And, you know, I explained to you that this is how it is. Like, I've changed it so that it's like, it's going to be like this now, which should resolve the issue for most of you. And all of a was a release right away. And for me, just a couple of months earlier, I had automated Kevin's release process. So it was really just a push on the button to actually do the release. Super grateful because it used to take about half a day to do a release of like dedicated effort. Um, this was very popular and actually is a, was a really nice way to bond with the community. Um, and then, you know, someone snarky response in like a good snarky response, you know, pointing out how well I handled that, which actually really motivated me to handle future issues well, too. Um, you know, not a bit, so like some people still just but you know, hey, but like that happens. Um, and so I was really pleased that, that the community is able to just, you know, accept my decisions. Okay, almost done. Um, 
Uh, it's really hard to trade like uh, all sort of stuff in this issue. They had actually the worst time of it. Like, uh, you can see all these duplicate issues. Yeah, I just had the one. Um, and, and I felt kind of bad. It, so, like, this has happened. It's not just my project. Um, you know, you may have it happen years as well. Uh, unfortunately, like, the balance issue, it, sometimes it just persists and persists. You get a lot of toxicity. Um, here's, you know, one tweet where, uh, you know, I was called greedy by charging for businesses to use the official miners. You know, I so that's them source for free. Um, this was a case where, again, they misunderstanding or whatever, but like people just didn't like me as much, and they didn't like the project as much. And like, okay, well, that's fine. Like, you don't have to be a part of our community. Um, but it kind of wears down on you. Uh, and that so the licensing issue was a problem. Oh, and then releasing telemetry was also not a popular decision. I do a lot of really unpopular things, I think. Um, the real community and, and the security community were very opinionated. Um, and so it took some of those like one thousand. It was basically a hit piece. Um, it didn't make any sense. And it was totally wrong and almost every corner. And so um, like claiming that I was the exclusive or sole contributor to the project, and we have over 200 contributors. Anyways, um, stuff like this, like, it, 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 it throws you out of balance. And you need to step away from it, you need to detach yourself from the project. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and other items in that, I really enjoyed the header in my third book. This is funny. The joke really the unlocked caveat. <laughs> Uh, but actually, it didn't make me laugh. I still enjoy it. And so, I, like after all of these things, the licensing issues and just the stress of the incidents and dealing with major incidents and the telemetry, like the, the pushback from that, I, I actually removed this phrase from my Twitter bio where I said that I was an open source advocate. And I, I decided that I, I no longer blanketly or, or like generally advocate open source. But it's more nuanced now. Like I still advocate open source if, and then there's like a bunch of conditions on it. And so, but I think, I think generally, like for especially like small projects, open source, and, and especially Go, like the Go community is awesome. And I've been in a lot of other like programming communities. I love the Go community, and I, it is definitely an exception, exceptionally good. Community. A lot of those experiences that I've had as an open source maintainer are actually not with the Go community. A lot of you just a caddy or like the you know, security community or you know, like InfoSec or like and, and other communities, which are, are just different. They're, they're good in their own ways, but they have different dynamics from the Go community. Um, anyways, I'm so kind of excited that you know, open source work is not. All positive. So I'm being real with you guys. Like it's great, but it's not all great all the time. So I read this article about some of my experiences after the licensing fiasco. Um, just putting out some of my thoughts about like what it really is like to be an open source maintainer. And it's um, I still do it because it's so satisfying, but I have to pace myself, I have to take breaks. Um, and and that's not really like it actually is really good. Here's an example of, of how um, open source can be a lot of fun. Uh, if any of you follow Swift on security, uh, she, really, she actually likes Kelly. Um, I was I, I was thrilled to find that out. That was in my day. And like, and you, get, you get good feedback from your projects too. So, this is the balance that I'm talking about. There really is, there's good, and there's a lot of things in the dark sometimes. But, um, like the client community, uh, like the, my local client community here is super chill. I make friends, it's super fun. I can talk to anyone, no one judges you. Um, I wish I could say the same thing about open source. But when people are chill and when they are conversational and, and whatever it is, when they're not judging you, it, it is a lot of fun. And I would be more involved in the open source world if it was more like that. It was more like my local climbing community, my local climbing gym. Um, and so, and honestly, like, and I, 
and then it was best contributed to the open source community either, and I'm working on that because of this balance issue. But um, yeah, yeah, trying to try and be like that. So, so these are these are some of the many elements that go into open source projects. And uh, I'm sorry, I know this was a go meetup, and it wasn't so much about go, but um, hopefully that this was a good way to at least think about. So many Go projects are open source, and the Go community is really great. So I hope you'll get involved. I hope you'll, uh, you know, try and find a problem, find a solution, and find balance. Uh, find yourself an open source because it really is, it, it, it can be fun. So anyway, real quick before I finish, what is coming next? Um, you know, you just you build the lessons that you learn, and we're going to do that. As we prepare Caddy 1.0 release, I'm really going to do that in the next month or two. Um, we're just going to we're going to lose the vendor folder. We're going to switch to go to modules. Hopefully, if I can get the build server, like our, our download page, to, to work with that stuff. But that's the last major change, and then we can add a guarantee uh, for 1.0 as well. Like I'm not breaking changes and kind of document, but like those are the last major changes, and then I think we're going to lose Caddy 1.0. And that's really exciting. We're going to have five more hopefully come later this year, which we'll have to find out. So, anyway, um, thank you so much for paying attention. I hope I didn't time in that. Is there any questions? Uh, any other questions? Oh, uh, thanks for the talk, Matt. And for the time, follow me on Twitter. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, Matt. It was really great. Uh, if you have any questions, we can shoot it in the chat and then we can answer. Right? If somebody has questions, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Right. So I had two questions, right? Uh, uh, what are some of the crazy use cases you have seen of Caddy in the wild? Like something you didn't expect people to use Caddy for, right? And mm, secondly, yeah. uh, if let's say you had the ability to go back in time and change some of the decisions you have taken, what would be the number one decision you would probably report it? Uh, those are good questions. So use cases for caddy. Um, just looking up some of my notes here because yeah, I think um, so I expect a lot of people to use it for their personal projects. Uh, I was really surprised to find people like embedding it into devices, a lot of like Raspberry Pi powered devices, um, which makes sense, I guess, because it's a totally static binary, so it's very portable. Um, that was surprising. That was so surprising. Yeah, again, like finding out that like uh, humanitarian efforts and like Panama Canal and like these random international like use cases. Are, oh, I think Netflix internally just testing like. Uh, infrastructure, I found on their GitHub somewhere. So it just kind of pops up. Um, and then a decision that I would mean, change or uh, the stance that I would maybe look at differently. I think I think I covered most of what I would like the stance that I would change like in my talk, but um, or at least in five. I probably, I don't know if I would change my like stance on anything, but I would probably change how I responded to a lot of things, and I'd be a lot more patient. I'm, I'm going to be more patient, and I'm going to be um, more understanding, and I'm really trying to figure out what people are trying, like what they are trying to do, and like what their goals are, and then try to see if I can help them that and understand that. And I think that would make and make things a lot better. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. And we can come closer or if we can just leave in the mic. Amen. Thanks for hearing. Yeah. So, uh, thanks yeah. for your talk. It's pretty helpful. Uh, as someone who's never given, done an open source contribution before and, and is looking to yeah, get into that space, uh, that provided some interesting perspective. So, I had a question. Towards the end, you mentioned that you're going to be moving towards Go modules and removing the vendor folder. Uh, is that decision related? Like, are the two of them related? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I think that's a good question. 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 Um, I think that
decision So uh, removing the vendor folder is that related to you uh, uh, moving towards Go modules? Oh, um, yeah, I, well, mostly the vendor folder is really heavy. I think there's there's a million lines of code or half a million. There's a lot of stuff in there and just to lighten up the repository of it. Uh, also, vendoring has caused a few technical issues for us uh, with regards to plugins because of the whole like, uh, if, if a vendor dependency exports a type that you use and you can't, like, you can't use the exported type without getting like compiled errors and because it comes from the vendor folder when you like in one part of the code and it comes from the web app in another part of the code and so we had issues like that but hopefully it will be resolved by just using go modules because really the all we need is just reproducible code you just need to pin versions um, Like garbage collection pauses in a Go web server. Uh, and those who are, I mean, yeah, like Steam web servers are extremely well performing, especially like Nginx. Um, but I don't think I've had any customers really like have an issue with it. One more thing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about you use Go plugin. Uh, mm -hmm. Since I'm using Go, but I've never used Go plugin. Uh, um, yeah, I should clarify, we're not using Go plugins. Um, I, I, I mean, design plugins to mean, uh, and probably should explain this, is a big question. Um, by plugin, I mean you add a, an underscore import to your Go code. So if you remember with like Go SQL package, you always import 
a simple package, uh, like a simple driver with like an underscore import because you import it for side effects. And so we do that. So that's like a plugin. That's basically a plugin. That's kind of what I mean in this sentence. Because it, it, when you import it, it registers itself with whatever package you're using. And that's why it's a plugin. Yeah, good question. Hey Matt, uh, thanks for the talk. Thanks for Caddy and thanks for the uh, talk. Um, so Caddy is this is it is it sort of you build your own DSL for the configuration? Sorry, can I add again? Again, Caddy Yeah. So Caddy with Caddy you build the own DSL for your configuration. Yes. And uh, I just wanted to know. For uh, what the experience for building a DSL uh, in Go? In the sense, there are some, like, for example, uh, say Ruby or uh, Scala, for the matter, building DSLs or processing them is uh, sort of easier or, uh, because of the dynamic nature and there's a freedom of new places for certain things. Uh, how, does, how does it feel in Go to? With the DSL and processing it. Yeah, um, that's a good question. It was, it was kind of fun. Um, I hadn't written like a parser or a lecture except for in school, like academic projects. So it was fun to actually do it for real. Um, but it was also a little painful in the sense that like I, I realized how hard it is to write a good like language spec and to enforce that and to have a good implementation that is like exactly with the stack. It's, it's amazing that like the, the Go parser and you know there are good method, method, methodical ways to do it. And I probably could have employed some of those methods. Um, but yeah, uh, there, there is a reason too, a practical reason beyond just the challenge of writing like a, a, a parser. And, and that is it's just easy to write. I, I couldn't find a good syntax that I liked. It was like Easy to, to write. Like JSON's a pain to write. It's obviously it's a common go to, but if you're writing it by hand, it's not visible. It was like Tomlin and YAML. I hate YAML. I, I just hate YAML. <laughs> I hate the spaces and I hate the. And then YAML is the really new weird. Sorry, what? I, I was saying YAML is the new X on that. But yeah, no, no, we're not even going to go there. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, the academy file is really simple. It, it definitely has its limitations, which I like. We've learned over the couple of years there are things that Caddy cannot be configured to do very well because of the Caddy file syntax. But that's like, you know, the point one percentile. Like, that's the edge cases for sure. Okay. Uh, thanks for answering the questions. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chad. It was great to join you guys. Hey guys, uh, let's quick, uh, quickly get started. So I'm going to try and keep it short because we have another talk coming. So, and uh, this I don't think is going to take the full 45 minutes. So, uh, sorry, all right. So, uh, this uh, conversation slash talk is about uh, Go modules. So, it's a nice segue from what uh, Matt was just talking about. Like he mentioned that how he's going to get rid of the vendor folder, right? So, uh, please feel free to stop me because my slide is this because my talk was initially going to be about draft and open consensus and all that. But uh, I was reading the comments of the meetup and somebody suggested that, hey, they would really like to cover this. So I looked at the other talks. So I thought like this would be probably more fit for today, right? I'll talk about uh, Raft at, at a different time. So uh, Go has had uh, support for vendoring officially since uh, Go 1.5 when the uh, vendoring experiment was essentially enabled, right? 
So does everybody here understand what I mean by rendering? Right. Okay. Okay. So, so some people uh, don't know that. I'll quickly explain. So, like, if you have worked in other uh, platforms, right, or other languages, you will have stuff like a gem file, or uh, I don't know what package JSON, right, uh, for node modules, right. So every every uh, language slash uh, I guess framework has ability to specify what libraries you depend on, what versions of libraries you depend on, right? So why do you think that is, right? Like if we can have a mic which is available to uh, the audience, that would be nice, right? Why do you think that is, right? I, I, I will volunteer an answer, simply because let's say you are building uh, some sort of a service and that's dependent on a particular library, right, to work. You do not want that library to essentially change under your feet, right? Why that would be really awesome that you should just upgrade it automatically. But what will end up happening is that uh, let's say a particular API you were dependent on on the library, that might change. The signature for that might change, right? And if that changes under you, suddenly your build will fail for no change in your own code base, right? And that's really bad, right? So when you're building a product, you already have lots of problems to deal with. You have features to develop, you have bugs to squish. So you do not want this sort of a problem to happen. So this is typically known as having the ability to have reproducible builds. Means if let's say you have a particular, uh, like if you have a code repository and you have a uh, particular hash for a commit, right? Let's say git sha. You want that git sha to always give the same output. If it was failing, it should fail. If it was succeeding, it should give you the same uh, output in terms of the art. Uh, by the which it produces, right? So, so that you can depend on that SHA as, uh, how, how, like what's the best way to put it? Like you can rely on that always to be deployed, right? So if let's say you have uh, a whiteboard where you write the SHA of the last successful build, right? I don't know why you do that, but if you do it, at least that will remain true, right? Because, but if you're, let's say the dependency is floated automatically, right? That would be a problem, right? So in in uh, a gem file or let's say package JSON, you get some sort of flexibility for this. Means you can specify that uh, because most of the libraries nowadays use let's say a semantic version, right? So they'll have a major dot minor dot patch hyphen, and then you'll have a sha or potentially a build tag associated. So the reason why this whole sem semantic version came about is so that the the consumers of your library didn't have to do upgrades for every patch release you made to your library, right? So what I mean by patch? So when I say major or minor dot patch, uh, your major version is only supposed to change if let's say you are making a breaking API change, right? So let's say you had a uh, package called math and it, took, it had a method called add which took X and Y and returned a value, right? Let's say instead of the X and Y being ints, you change it to be X and Y being 64s. It might not appear to be as a breaking change, but guess what? For a type language like Go, it can. It can break a lot of things, right? So at that point, you would probably go ahead and upgrade your major version, right? But let's say you added a method called delete, uh, multiply, right? Which also took an X and Y and returned the multiplication, right? You probably don't need to upgrade the major version there because think about it, right? The fact that the existing API surface has not changed at all means the existing users of your library can continue using your updated version without breaking anything in their site, right? That's how it's supposed to work, right? Air quotes. Uh, so you add a multiply method, you just let it go from 1.1 to 1.2 and you're golden, right? And what is this patch? So let's say you had a bug in that add method, right? In the sophisticated add method, you had a bug and you want to fix that. So what you would do is you would go from 1.0.0 to 1.0.1. So that's signaling to your consumers that, hey, I fixed a bug. Please feel free to go ahead. I have not made any changes to API surface, right? That's how it's supposed to work, right? So where things go, go bad is because the people doing these changes are also human, right? And there will be subtle changes in behavior from time to time, which in their heads was not a big deal, but it ended up becoming a big deal because let's say that uh, that whole int 64 thing, right? Most of the time it will work out, right? 
But where it may not work out is, let's say, if you have used reflection in your package, right, to specifically pass a value to that method. That's not compatible anymore, right? Int and int 64 are two different types. So in that situation, you would want extreme control on what exact version you're consuming, right? At the same time, like I said, gem file and package JSON will allow you to say, I am okay with all 1.4 releases. It's okay for the patch version to go up automatically, right? But there are there is a school of thought which will say that that should not be automatic. Even that patch version being upgraded should be an explicit action. It means the developer should be knowing that, hey, I am going from 1.0.1 to 1.0.2. So that's where the whole uh, gem file or lock file comes in, right? Where you have the exact version spin, right? That this is the exact version. The gem file will specify the floating version. The gem file or lock specifies the exact version, right? So that if, let's say, there is a, a certain change in the underlying library, you will notice it, right? Uh, there have also been cases where uh, I don't remember the exact name in the Node.js no world. There was a very simple library which was left responsible. Left Sorry? Left pad. Left pad. Yeah, the famous left pad, right? So maybe you guys can tell the story, right? So uh, what happened there? Like, uh, some, some, yeah, so he removed the library, right? And apparently, the whole left pad functionality was so like intense, right? They were like, in, Innumerable amount of libraries dependent on that, and innumerable amount of dependent on those libraries, right? So everything broke because that library completely disappeared from the chain, right? So that is when sort of people realize the problem behind doing like this. Because think about it, they did everything right. They had a package JSON which specified the dependency on the library, which had a package JSON which specified a dependency, like uh, like 15 layers down, there was left pad, right? So at that point, because left pad disappeared. Everything along the line completely broke, right? Simply because what happens when you do packages? What, what is that whole node modules folder, right? I, I'm drawing a parallel to Node.js and then we'll come to the Go world, right? So that is essentially like a exploded view of your packages, right? All the dependencies, what they depend on, what they depend on, so on and so forth, till there is no dependencies, right? So sometimes it is like there's a joke there that if you, let's say, create a new uh, Express JS app, you're talking about like a 200 MB package JSON because that's everything, right? See, it's not just that uh, there's a lot of workers code because a lot of times these Node.js modules depend on uh, native dependencies, right? Like C and stuff, which gets compiled to object files. So, yes, that's pretty large. So, the same exact problem can happen in the Go world as well, where people initially, like when Go 1.1 happened, right? You just did a Go get to get a particular thing down your system, right? That was so convenient. You just like took a GitHub repo uh, name, did a go get, and that, that's it, right? Uh, that worked because it would sort of recursively go and download all dependencies, right? It broke down the moment people started releasing second versions of libraries, right? Uh, the Go developers were in denial for the longest time because inside Google, where Go was born, they typically didn't do it that way. Go get is not something they used, right? Go get was something like they added as a sugar on top for the open source community to quickly get together, right? So in the in, inside Google, all the dependencies they depend on, including let's say JDKs and let's say Node.js versions, everything is checked in, right? So what that means is, if I have a particular SHA which corresponds to a particular uh, commit in time, everything that is needed to get that combinatory compiled is checked in, right? So there is nothing changing underneath your leg. So if let's say that was done, right? If let's say we had the node modules checked in in every package in Node.js uh, project, you would have not suffered the left uh, left pad problem because the left pad would have existed in our mm -hmm. in our personal copy of uh, let's say the node modules history, right? But that is typically not done for let's say uh, Node.js because, like I said, the node modules is very large. It is a compiled. Uh, version of all the modules, uh, like a lot of modules use the binary versions, uh, like they will be as, uh, like a thin wrapper over the C library for MySQL, for example, right? Uh, the reason why they do that is, let's say I'm writing a MySQL driver for Node.js, right? I can do that in native JavaScript, a lot of people do that. But where it really starts suffering is, we're talking about a binary protocol here, right? MySQL is a binary protocol. So if you try and parse binary protocols in JavaScript, it's going to suffer in performance, right? So people typically 
like a wrapper over the C library, right? So in the Go world, it's slightly different because uh, when you do rendering, you are essentially getting all the uh, code which uh, would have defined a library and putting that in a folder for me, right? And again, that is done so that even if you are allowing versions to flow, you still have explicit control on what's checked in, right? Your reality does not change from under you. So uh, when you have a vendor folder, you would uh, go ahead and like, before Go modules came on, there were a lot of third party tools like Glide, uh, I think Govan, uh, there was GoDeps, right? There was a bunch of them, right? Which were essentially put together by the community because uh, again, the Go developers were in denial that, hey, we don't need rendering because they thought rendering was a solved problem. That's the most obvious thing to do. Like, how could you build a product without mm -hmm. the vendor folder, right? So they thought, like, you would figure it out, right? I don't need to give you a prescription, right? So the history around that, the reason why we have Go modules right now, like, we have to thank Dave Chain for that. The reason is, uh, Dave Chain, again, being a very influential person in the Go world, he put together a... Uh, package uh, called GB, right? I think we call it Go Build, right? So that sort of tried to prescribe a way for you to write Go programs, right? And it took an opinionated approach around rendering as well, right? So like I had a long conversation with him about why he was doing that because he also acknowledged the fact that this might bifurcate the Go community because a lot of people will use Go get, some people will start using GB and obviously neither is compatible with the other, right? So the reason he said, and I, I respected him for that, is that he was forcing the issue. Because the Go code that code team, right, was not acknowledging the need for a sanction rendering solution, right, or a module system as we have right now, he said, if I create this, they will feel the need for putting things back together because they will realize that I am by getting things right. And that really, really helped, right? So as soon as that happened, that was around the Go 1.49. We had the Go rendering experiment started. So when rendering experiment started, what that what they did is, let's say you have a uh, Go file which imports a bunch of packages. So rendering experiment was very simple. If you enable, uh, I think Go one file render experiment equal to two, what the Go compiler would do is that it would look for a sort of like a folder which is at the same level as you, right, or uh, at a higher level. We look for a folder called vendor and you could try and look for packages which you are importing inside that folder. That instantly solved the problem of hey, how do I make sure that my dependencies are not changing on this, right? I can't depend on Go get or at the compile time, right? So uh, that was the initial solution that worked really well. But what that did not fix is a way for packages, right? To identify a version for itself. There was no semantic version happening in the Go world, right? There were a few attempts. Yeah. I'm not sure how the rendered folder is so fast. So before this any volume system came to the university, yeah. Uh, the Go uh, the so that was now Go 1.5 uh, vendor experience. Before that, it was not there. So what people used to do, I, I talked about that, this is a very good question, is uh, people used to essentially, so let's say you're creating a project. This would not work for a library. Let's say you're creating a project. Means, uh, in, a program you are creating for execution, like a binary, right? So what you would typically do is you would make the root of your project a the Go path, right? So what that means is uh, whenever you have a Go path, the SRC folder is where all the packages are checked in. So your SRC folder essentially became your vendor folder. Does that make sense? Right? No, it's not the Go gateway. So you are sort of fooling the Go tool chain to do go get into your go path. Make sense? Meaning, so a go path has three things, right? It has a bin, PKG, and SRC, right? SRC is where all the code is shown, right? Uh, bin is where your uh, binaries end up, and PKG is where all the, let's say, libraries get compiled into, right? So, like I'm taking a thousand foot view here, but that's typically how it is, right? 
So what you do is uh, both the bin and the PKG folder you would actually be ignored, right? So that they don't get actually injected. You would have to write some script to essentially scrub all the cloned reports inside your SRC because they would contain their own .gits as well, right? So you want to get rid of that. And once you have done that, you can essentially go, go ahead and check in all the entire SRC tree, and that essentially became sort of like a pseudo vendor system, right? The reason why we have this system right now is because when Russ Cox, the head of the gold uh, team, right, took a survey of what people were doing in the wild, right, he noticed that people were bending over backwards to get rendering support, and it could really, like, uh, Go could really use a official support because until the official tag is attached to something, people will choose their depth, their DP, all of this, right? All of this will happen. Somebody will say, I'll roll my own, that's better than everything else, right? But the moment an official tag is attached to something, people are like, will take a few moments before coming up with their own solution because this is maintained. This is automatically supported in all the tool sets. What they're doing is not. In fact, in my own startup, right, we had done that system because I wanted to vendor. So what I would do is, Every time I would try and compile, I would create a temporary directory, and trust me, I did all this, right? Where I would copy all my source code and essentially make that temporary directory into a Go path, right? So I had a vendor folder whose contents I would copy into the SRC of the temp directory so that it became a Go path with all the libraries I needed, and I would compile based on that Go path variable, right? So I'm very thankful that this happened, right? So yes, to answer your question, before Go 1.5 vendor experiment, people used to do crazy things to simulate that. The moment Go 1.5 vendor experiment enabled, so it blessed that folder called vendor, right? So what, what it allowed me to do is, I don't have to create a pseudo Go path anymore. I don't have to copy my vendor stuff into SRC anymore, right? If I have it in vendor, the Go compiler will take care of that, right? So the reason why they did it this way, like even this is also an experiment, right? Go 1.11, sort of like you have to enable it, Go in, uh, in Go 1.13, it will become enabled by default, right? The whole module support is because they wanted people, they wanted people to have some sort of buffer time. Because otherwise, the shock of suddenly the vendor folder becoming blessed, right, could potentially break bits. Because it's possible somebody in the wild would have used vendor folder to represent the vendors in a order management system, right? What, do, what does it do there, right? So they gave people to uh, an opportunity to migrate over, right? And that worked out really well. So towards the uh, beginning of Go 1.8 is when Russ Cox uh, sort of published uh, his version of what he thought the Go module system should be like, right? So it, it's a very simple system, right? It's complicated in its implementation, but it's simple in its usage, right? That's a very good balance. So the go.mod file is essentially our package.json or uh, gem file, right? The go.sum file is the equivalent of a gem file.log. I don't know what the equivalent of Node.js gem file that long. Sorry? Okay, sure. There you go. Right? So the go sum will specify the exact commit hashes which are supposed to be used uh, when you are essentially uh, recreating a build, right? And Go module can specify protein versions and uh, it, it can essentially be as vague as you want, right? Depending on how serious you are about your project, right? So. But where does vendoring fit into all this, right? Because I spoke about go.mod and go.sum, right? So the vendoring part was actually something which the community was not very happy with. Because like Matt said, if let's say you are building a serious enough project like he was, your vendor folder, because of all the dependencies, and I'm talking about just code here, not even binary, not even anything which should not be checked in, just the code, right, can actually get into megabytes, tens of megabytes, right? So your code is maybe like, 200 KB, your vendoring is uh, tens of megabytes, right? So that can become a problem. So that is specifically a problem if you're building a open source project, which the first interaction which anybody has with the open source project is cloning, right? And if the first step takes multiple minutes because of a 10 MB vendor folder, it's not a very good UX. It's the same reason when, let's say, uh, you go and download any popular software out there, let's say Chrome, right? The first download is not 57 MB. It's a tiny installer which gives you this fox hope that, oh, it's done, right? And then it will start the install process, right? And also another reason is because their installer will be very smart about resuming downloads, about you maximizing the TCP transfer speed and all of that, right? But very similar. So uh, like Matt would be concerned if I was in shoes, I would be concerned about a 10 MB vendor file. So for him, 
it's good enough to have a go dot mod file which specifies dependencies and a go dot sum file which locks the version so what happens when somebody let's say clones the repo they just get two files but whenever they do a go build or a go install or a go get even right uh, the go compiler is smart enough to make sure that only those versions are cloned right if there is a discrepancy it's going to call it out to you it's not that you will get accidental changes of behavior in your uh, product because some of the libraries change underneath right and that is building on the assumption that only maybe nsa could go ahead and uh, forge a commit means the same commit with the same sha but a different uh, code right that's not going to happen in, in real world so it's building on that right but the perspective is slightly different for let's say me who is building an internal service for a company right uh, i'll tell you why because i don't have to get people to clone my repo right so that's not a problem so for me the primary importance is reproducible builds meaning it's possible that github is suffering a downtime at some point right it's possible that maybe it's not github maybe the guy has put some code in bitbucket maybe he has put some code in code.google.com i don't know right if that is the case my build would need to go ahead and download all of those repositories before my code actually compiles so there i would take the trade off and actually enable rendering in go modules right so if you give a uh, argument and it is supported by almost go all of the go tool chains uh, hyphen mod equal to render that enables rendering meaning your go tool chain will now again respect the vendor folder and will not try and fetch anything from the network right i i believe there are options uh, which are there where uh, you can essentially let's say one second i'll just unmute right right so uh, yeah something in a go path because typically remember go path stuff were not using rendering classically right so it will expect the fact that go modules does not automatically switch on if you are inside a go path right but if you are outside the go path system it will switch on the go modules automatically right so they did that based on the user survey where they asked people what the behavior they would want to see so not in go path no no so another thing which happens as a result of this is that remember like what was the expected thing that you developed in go path correct and if you wanted to do outside go path you still need to give go path some value right where it would put the pkg and bin and all of that they going away from that right so go path does not need to exist post go 1.11 right you can develop completely outside the go path directly simply because when you are outside go path and if your variable is either on or auto the flag to switch on go modules it will expect a go dot mod and the place where your go dot mod is placed is the root of your project now it doesn't have to be a go path right because uh, the go path thing right was again a very goofy thing in the past because google follows a mono repo right they all of their code is in one folder so they would make that the go path and call it a day right so everything was under the go path but a lot of people when they created multiple projects and stuff they're like hey i'm working on three different projects which is my go path should i create a master folder with which i make my go path and everything is like a subdirectory people did crazy things like they would create a go path create siblings in there for projects 
a lot of things were done, right? So they have gotten rid of that concept now, or at least uh, they are sort of phasing it out. So if you have a Go mod, Go path is not required anymore, right? Because uh, what happens is the root of your module is where it will expect your modules to be defined. Your packages can be uh, like, for example, uh, whenever you do a go dot mod file, right? I can probably show an example here. <laughs> Oh, for them. Visible? Thought of? Right. Right. So this is a Go module file, right? Go dot mod. So uh, the first line defines what my project is called. Let's say I'm calling it Normandy here, right? So all the imports I do from here on out are essentially relative to this. So I don't have to do like what we used to do earlier, right? Let's say your company is uh, at uh, github.com slash simple, right? Let's say that, right? And now you have a service in there. So, and you have a package inside that service. So typically in all code, unless you fake your go path, you would essentially end up importing uh, import github.com simple slash X, Y, Z slash package name, right? You don't have to do that anymore. You can simply say whatever the project name is and all imports are related to this name now. So that's, that's an improvement It's a quality of life improvement, which is coming as a result of getting rid of the go path concept, right? So this essentially is a go, go module where I'm specifying versions. I can be vague if I want, right? Uh, these are all the dependencies I have, right? At the same time, this is the go dot sum file, as you guys can see, it is more specific, right? It specifies the exact shards of the uh, libraries which I'm dependent on, right? So that they don't float apart, right? And this is my sort of like, okay, it's so much crap in here. This is my vendor folder, which is very similar to the vendor folder, which was there. We just took a very like roundabout way to get back to this, right? But what I was trying to talk about again is that this vendor folder is optional. You don't have to do it, right? Because for a lot of people, the safety which go.mod and go.sum provide is good enough. Means you will just pull down the dependencies. You will be guaranteed that the dependencies which you pull down are the same ones you built initially on and you are happy, right? But somebody who wants to ensure that their build is always reproducible in case of network failures, they don't, let's say GitHub is slow that will end up affecting the speed of your build as well, right? Because until the modules are pulled down, you can't do it, right? So if somebody does not want to take that pain, they can go ahead and do the rendering. It will work this well, right? Uh, they have provided another mechanism as well for somebody who whose vendor folder is so large that they actually feel icky about checking that in. Like for a major project, like Kubernetes, the vendor folder can be hundreds of megs, right? So at that point, uh, what option they provide is you can essentially, in your company, create a proxy for this. So it's like a caching layer. So you say that this proxy is going to hold the dependencies I'm dependent on. It's like a, a very simple lookup service where given this shard, it gives you the dependency, right? So what that allows you to do is it allows you to get rid of that whole network dependency your build has otherwise. So there are multiple options available of making your code, uh, like, you know, to make sure that it always builds. Once green, you always stay green, right? Multiple options available. First layer, go.pod, go.sum. Second layer is go.pod, go.sum with a proxy. Third layer, if you're really pedantic, you can render and you're good, right? And this works seamlessly for go get as well. Meaning, if let's say you're an end user, not the one creating the project. If you, let's say, do uh, go get github.com simple, that's some tool they have created, right? Which internally is using go module. So the go get command is smart enough to first pull down the thing, then look at the go mod, pull down the dependencies, then build it, then put it in your go path, right? So it's like a very good hybrid system which they have created and it works really, really well, right? So my recommendation would be, so if you're creating a new project right now, as of this day, you should definitely use Go module because let's say a couple of months ago, maybe in December, uh, like who all use show of hands, use VS Code here for a prize, wow. 
<laughs> that's interesting <laughs> because uh, uh, before VS Code, a lot of people use uh, Sublime, right? There was a Go Sublime plugin which people use. Uh, a lot of people use uh, Vim. Uh, Go Land is there. The ID is there, right? It's really good, but I feel that my laptop feels very warm when I use it, right? So I, I think I'm good with VS Code, right? Yes. So that's a that's a big thing, right? So in Go, remember once something is blessed, people take it and go, right? So Go FMT was blessed back like ten years ago or whatever, right? All of us are trust me have saved like hundreds of hours because we have not argued about tabs and spaces, never, right? <laughs> similarly, similarly. Now that Go modules is blessed, it's okay. All of those third-party vendor libraries will happily go and die somewhere, right? The, the authors of those libraries are more than happy. Because they don't have to maintain this project. They were doing the uh, vendoring tools because they felt the need. Now, this solution is considered as the smartest vendoring solution across platforms, across frameworks, right? This is really smart. The way it handles diamond dependency. What is diamond dependency? Who knows that? Okay, so simple, simple thing, right? If let's say you have a uh, library called A, depends on B and C. B and C depend on D, right? So now, which version of D is compiled into it, right? That's the problem, right? Because if let's say you have two different versions, means B says I am dependent on 0.1.x, and uh, C says I'm dependent on I'm latest, I'm 2.1, right? So then, what does A do? Because now there are two copies of this, right? So there is like there's a section. Uh, dedicated to diamond dependency and all these all little nuances in the wiki like my presentation wiki page right which i will link to you guys should really go to that right because if let's say you are in a capacity to help your team adopt this you should definitely do this right it solves the problem so like i said uh vs code and the plugin which is there in vs code for go was not that good with go modules back in december right but a lot of the tool chain has now adopted and uh, become advanced enough to understand Go modules, the old system, the new system, all of it, right? It's a little slow because they have to do a few hoops. So, like for example, if you do go to definition, right? It will maybe take a second extra, right? But it's getting faster, it's getting there, right? In fact, the end result is that once they have uh, modified.
Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hence the vendor folder. Hence the proxy. Okay, that will be like a different approach, right? If everyone is clicking to go over. Right. Um, can we like? Is there any way to you know work side by side? Okay, instead of uh, putting all the things to a, like a some separate folder, maybe right. configure it to some maybe like a more vendor folder. If you if you want if everything is locked in uh, folder, is there an option to put? Yeah, so folder? that's the hyphen mod thing. If you do hyphen mod, it will proxy. You will go to your proxy to fetch things, right? If and it will not try and do it via public internet. If you let's say do go mod vendor, it will expect you to have run a command called go mod vendor. So what that does is that it will look at your go mod and go some file and download at that point all dependencies and put it in a vendor folder which you can check in. In the same level, you can create that folder and put it in. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Right? And once it is done, the idea is that you as a dev, let's say you're developing a feature, you've just added a library, you have all the time in the world to fix that problem, right? If that library is not downloading for whatever reason, you'll switch to a different library or not, all right? So the problem which they're trying to avoid is Let's say on a Friday evening, now you need to fix a bug in production. Your colleague is blessed with the opportunity, right? So at that point, what do you do? You will not be there, right? Your colleague is essentially dependent on the Go mod downloading cleanly in your CI, right? So at that point, that is where the problem will come. So that could mean that uh, to fix the problem, he has to upgrade the version potentially. So that whole caching thing also is not a foolproof thing, right? So if you have that dependency that this is a mission critical app, I cannot afford downtime because of build failures and all that shenanigans, you have a vendor folder which takes care of that problem. Right. Uh, yeah. So since the PKG folder is itself is like a uh, vendor folder itself. So what right. we did was in our CSD pipeline, uh, we have Docker runner that's in this. So we just cache the mobile yeah. folder on the so it essentially acts as a vendor folder and that right. is mounted on the uh, sure. of the CSV. Yes. So like I said, people went very creative with solutions before this happened, right? Like so we are already on this. Oh, you are doing it on top of that? Yes. Okay. So after you do this thing, uh, you can just cache your uh, Gopal right. uh, in your CSV. Right, server. right. And that essentially acts as a vendor. Sure, sure. So you are essentially using the temporary location which the GoMod system uses to cache its dependencies. And you mount that as a way for go yeah. to get it at a later yeah. point. Yeah, sure, that's smart. That's smart. That that will work too. So we don't even need to check check it in branch. It's pretty much. Yeah, that will work too. That that's a smart way to do it. Awesome. So any other question? Yeah. Um, can I have a dependent? I mean, say suppose I have a project which is a go module. Can I have a project which uh, have a dependency which is not on go modules? Right. In which case I need to vendor some part and some more parts are No, it's part. either all or nothing at that point, right? So, uh, uh, what it would do is that uh, I've seen go .mod, uh, go mod, right? It will add everything you're dependent on. If let's say the library you're dependent on does not, it's like a very old library, right? It does not do semantic versioning, it doesn't do anything, right? It will just add the, the complete SHA of the latest commit which you're dependent on, the master of that library as the version. And it'll just bring it in, right? Yeah. It is working on the assumption that most libraries out there were written for to be go gettable. So since it is go gettable, that means it can clone, right? And if it can clone, it has a SHA and it will use that. Okay, I think uh, yeah. So like recently we have actually migrated our project to go more. Awesome. Uh, and also we are ending with the vendor folder. Yeah. Like and and sure. Like but one problem for uh, maybe I've seen with the uh, Go model is, uh, let's say the particular people, people are working on the same version, oh, yeah. and they're into a different version. Right. So your Go mod file is very difficult to check in, or be you could be checking that. Okay, because it is a file created by a tool, right? You're not you're typically supposed to edit that. It will make sure that the things are in alphabetical order and all those things, right? So most of the times I've not seen like two different teams modify the same exact line. So like most of the times, your Git will be able to resolve those differences, right? But don't blindly check that in, right? Because if there's a change happening in Go model, you should pay attention to that, right? Uh, if there is a change happening to your Go sum, pay more attention to that because that something might be changing under your feet, right? And uh, where I have definitely seen problems happening is that if let's say somebody had a uh, pull request or like created a branch a while ago, and somebody has gone ahead and 
upgraded one of the modules, right? You might end up in rebase hell at that point, right? So, you, like typically, trunk-based development is encouraged in the Go world as well, right? So, check in often the master. Uh, like right, right. But that's uh, if you think about it, that's the only way to make sure you have reproduced tools. There. You can't miss out even one. That one could be the bad one, like left back. Okay, I think we're good. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Oh, you have more. Oh, cool. Oh, awesome. Hey, is you, you need the charger? I'm fully charged. Are you good? Still. Anyway, it's oh, good. Cool. Yeah. Do I need the mic or do you all hear me? Yes. Because I prefer to speak without the mic. Awesome. Good. Um, now you wonder why I'm here. I'm Federico. I'm work. I arrived Monday night in Mangalore, and I will stay until next Friday. And uh, I'm working uh, here in our office that we have with a team here. Um, I'm normally based in Sweden. And we have engineering office. I'm working for Meltwater uh, in the US, in England, in Canada, in Germany, and, and one here, actually. Uh, and that's uh, why I'm here. I'm an infrastructure engineer. Um, and I work for the engineering enablement mission. And you might wonder uh, what this is. Um, we are uh, three teams that do internal services for the company. We do an internal product for the company so that all the other engin engineers and engineering teams can just be more productive and, and uh, write software without having to think about stuff. So uh, a part of what we offer is like a centralized uh, monitoring, centralized metrics, centralized logging, uh, centralized CI, CD, and uh, Kubernetes as a service, and I'm part of the Kubernetes team. And why centralized? It makes life easier for all the teams because at Meltwater, I think two or three years ago, uh, we went the way to be totally an autonomous teams. 
every team has autonomy to decide how they code, what they, well, not what they code, but how they code it, where they run it in Amazon. Of course, that's the thing, but how they run it. They're free in their decisions, but we notice that uh, some of them don't want to manage some parts of the things. They want just to use an API. To, and, and that's why we have these three internal product teams. And I work for, um, for the Kubernetes teams. We are about three to 400 engineers, 350. Um, and yeah, what is Meltwater? Yes. Uh, could you share the screen? Because the screen they see is five different. Which one? Just share your desktop. 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 Yeah. Stop share. Just do stop share. Stop share, stop yeah. share there. And then do a new share again. Share. Share. Desktop. Yeah, desktop. Yeah, desktop. desktop. Good. Good. So um, uh, what is Meltwater? Uh, Meltwater is an media monitoring company. We ingest content from newspapers, from social media, Twitter, Instagram. We ingest uh, other information like uh, stock market, Dow Jones, and then we store everything in a big database. Uh, we enrich before we store it, so we, we, we match some stuff. We, we do sentiment analysis on, on the text and information. We, we match stuff from, from one source with another source. Uh, we, we classify it with what kind of language is this. Then we store everything in the database, and then our customers can just query that database either ad hoc, or they can uh, access it with, with an API, or they can have reports sent to them. Like the CEO of a company wants to know when his, the company name is mentioned in a bad way. So that's what, what the um, Melkward is doing. So what does now this talk about? Um, this talk is basically about a workshop that I attended <coughs> a couple of weeks ago in January in Berlin. There was a Go Days conference, and as part of uh, the conference, they offered a uh, workshop on how to use Go to extend Kubernetes. And we have now been using Kubernetes for one year in production, and now it's the time to get further. Uh, we have seen use cases that we cannot solve with the built-in stuff in Kubernetes or with third-party tools that are around there or plugins. Now we want to write our own stuff inside Kubernetes to extend it so that it behaves the way we want it to behave. And they had a workshop and that was a good uh, learning experience and then uh, I was here and there was a go meetup. I normally try to attend a meetup everywhere I go and I have succeeded so far. So I've been in the US and both in Spain, everywhere. So now one more city, I think it's like 35 cities I've been to and uh, at, uh, with meetups. So I decided what could I talk to and this go, Kubernetes perhaps extending. So I thought that could be uh, a nice thing to show because it took me and my colleagues some time to, uh, to, to, to grasp what it is, and this workshop was really an eye-opener. So who's using Kubernetes? Who's using Kubernetes in production? The same people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is about uh, extending the, the Kubernetes API programmatically. Anyone doing this? Anyone interesting? Oh, good. I can sit there and you can talk. <laughs> um, so for, for those of you that don't know what the Kubernetes is or how it works, we have all these worker nodes, the service where all the, 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 the stuff runs, and um, we have an agent there called Kubelet, and it talks to the Kubernetes API that is responsible then with the manager and the scheduler to distribute all the workloads and, and Docker containers. And you interact with this API as well on the command line with kubectl. Um, this API is nothing else than a regular uh, REST API. You have your uh, resources here, your paths, and um, one thing is that they made possible now is that you can add your own resources to it. And it, as I said, it's a regular REST API, so you can do all this stuff like get, create, update, and so on. And you have the possibility to extend it. So um, since it's a REST API, you have the kubectl client. 
this one just translates your commands on the command line to, to REST calls. So basically, you could interact with the API just writing curl, might be cumbersome. You could write your own library and your own uh, client, but that is also a li little bit difficult. So what you could do is, since kubectl interacts with the API, you could use the libraries that they build on. And you could also use the libraries that the agent uses to interact with the API. And where are these? And this is a how to find. So that was quite nice that um, basically you go into the Kubernetes client go repository and there you have these two to focus on. It's the Kubernetes one and then you, in tools you have another one. Here you have the clients and the client command. Then you want to use another part. This one lives in Kubernetes API repository. And here we go into the see it better here the core v1 there we have all the types and objects defined that uh, exist in kubernetes so you can reuse that code and definitions from there um, at the end you want to interact with the api and then you you use the um, api machinery repository and there you have a package and there you can interact with all the stuff. You can list stuff, you can delete stuff, you can get options, status, and so on. So with this part, you can basically now start to write a simple Kubernetes client. And it does not require a lot of code. I will move this chair away. So what you do, you import this from the client repository. And then, since you already interact probably with Kubernetes, you have a, a cube config file. You point your program to it, you instantiate it, a new client. And then in, for the, with this new client, you could already interact with pods and list them. Four or five lines, and you get the client to talk to Kubernetes. Now, you would need to pull each time the API and, and have this code and this logic uh, also to write. So what you do is you use the informers that they created. An informer is basically an, a proxy. You write your code here, the logic that interacts with the Kubernetes objects. Here is the API and the informer watches the API for you and stores all the results here and all the object that it gets. So you don't need to worry about that logic anymore. So it's one thing less. Um, it's still about the same code. You import the informers and then you still have a client. Yes. Yes. Yes, well, the, the informal part is, is the part that the, the Kubernetes project, um, a, a library of functionality um, provided that you interact with, with the objects in here and not directly with the API. It's like a proxy that manages the connection sharing, the, the watching the events. You don't need to pull each time. They, they do all these things behind here and you just interact with everything that the informer exposes to you. Because you don't want to, to be a, need want to uh, pull the, the, the API constantly and have maintain this logic. And um, basically this is also like a, a small store that you, that you can just um, query locally without having to go there if nothing has changed. The code is then still pretty much simple the same. You have your client here, and then you just instantiate an, an informer. And then instead of going to the API, you just go to the informer and list your pod objects and so on. I don't. Um, to interact with the, uh, with the object that live in Kubernetes, the pods, which are basically the containers, and then all the higher level abstractions like deployments and, and services and so on. 
Um, they are also defined here in the core v1 that you can import from. In the types though, you see here that you have pods, the pod specification, so the things that you want to run. Say, yeah, I want to have three red containers running of this application and the status as well. And then we could be used and say, yeah, I'm running two containers for these applications for you. So you can store this information there and it's already predefined for you. So you can just reuse it. Um, it provides you also with a lot of uh, boilerplate that you might need to have access to, to interact with the API and the other objects. It's in there. Um, it's quite nice to know where you find this stuff. And so now we have seen that with importing a few things, you can interact with the API and you can access and um, the building objects. But now you have also the possibility to extend the objects in Kubernetes with something that is called custom resource definitions. Long time ago, perhaps not that long, long uh, ago, but um, yeah, in the beginning, they were called uh, third party uh, types. But now they change the name to custom resource definitions. So what this means is that you can add your own objects to Kubernetes. And they behave the same like the built-in ones, like the pods, like deployments, like services. And uh, you just add them, you define them. For example, here I define a health check policy and the object is something that I want to know about how many uh, failed and how many past health checks I have. I want to store the stuff inside Kubernetes. So it's possible to extend it. You can extend it with whatever you want and also build your applications on top of it. So uh, I've seen people, since you have pods, the basic building blocks, your containers, and then you build your service, your deployments on top of it and your services and your ingress. It means that you need to maintain four YAML files, which is quite a lot. Um, I've seen this reduced for developers to just the basics. And then this custom resource adds all the other boilerplate to it. That's another way to do it. You can add objects that can control the built-in ones with a controller that reads it and then does something on, on, on top of it. So if we add this here, um, we then also need to tell Kubernetes on what this kind of objects are. And my application needs to have code that needs to um, interact with this. And now comes the tricky part that I never understood. Um, you run a code generator based on your um, definition of the object. But this code generator is controlled by comments in the code. So you add comments in the code, and then you run your code generator. Everything is explained here in the OpenShift blog post. And then magic happens. It generates code. Don't worry about it to look at it. It adds the code that corresponds to the object that are built in so that you can interact with your custom object. It's a bunch. It's a couple of megabytes, tens of megabytes. Um, and with this, you import the stuff, you define your custom resource, you generate code that interacts with the, this resource. Now you can write a, um, a controller that can interact with this new added object to it. So here it's, an example where they have generated the code. It lives here, you import that one. You still point to your configuration. You still have your client. And then you talk to this new object the same way as you did before with the built-in object. So from having nothing, importing something, being able to talk to the API with the um, built-in objects, 
Now you extend the API with these objects, generate code that can handle these objects. You can now talk through the API to those. And this program does not need to run on Kubernetes. You can basically run it on your laptop because it can reach the Kubernetes API. Once it's, you're satisfied, you can deploy it inside the cluster and use the cluster internal credentials to, to talk to the API. Um, so what have we been doing? So basically, we have been, here's the Kubernetes API. Um, we need to talk to the API somehow, store objects, and have a workflow of storing the stuff that changes and comes in. And this is taken care of. This part is taken care of the client go library. Oh, sorry. This part here is taken care of the informers talking to the API, storing the information and so on. So basically what is left is only this little part that you need to worry about. Talking to the informer, getting the objects out, writing your logic and writing it back to the API. So from this mess, and this mess, only this remains. And when I saw this at the workshop, I thought, wow, yeah, it's not that difficult actually. But you need to be <laughs> pointed to this fact. Because otherwise you're overwhelmed. Oh, I need to import this, I need to look there, I need to focus on this part. Oh, I need to generate code, but what is, do I need to do something with that now? Just do it. And focus on this. All this was mentioned at the at the workshop with exercises. Exists here, freely available, and it's still there after workshop. I can post this to the to the Slack channel yeah. um, when I'm done. Um, there is more information and. Here, in the repo, there's also the extended slides from the workshop that I um, made some screenshots of for this presentation. There's some more explanations on how these controllers work in a talk at the KubeCon conference from last year. There's a blog post written here and there is a sample controller. And in the sample controller, what you can do is really a lot of copy and paste code from it to get this started. And I have to thank these two guys. These were the uh, people doing the workshop and I got permission from them to reuse the slides for this, for this meetup. And that was it. Thank you.
Go on. Uh, yeah, all the others that come. Like, yes. have you guys considered using uh, any sort of service mesh, uh, like Istio? Or oh, we're like st that? we're starting with that to look right. into that. And uh, the the um, the interesting part is here that um, we want to offer a service mesh not only for Kubernetes, but we want and that this is my team since service mesh is often named together with Kubernetes, yeah, yeah. it ori originates from there. But we want to have the service mesh also possible to interact with resources running outside of Kubernetes. Sure. That the other teams use. Right. And then we have some legacy data center somewhere. Yeah, awesome. And we need to interact with that one as well. And for us, the important the important thing there is, I think, is that if the service mesh works with, with Kubernetes, with other things in the cloud, and could also interact with the stuff Less that is stuff. left in the, in the data center, the move from the data center to Kubernetes or the clouds would be faster because they don't need to lift and shift everything at right. once. Right. They can just move. Strangling, yeah. Part by part and still talk to something there without knowing that Right. They're living the, here. Uh, so the actual action of deploying, let's say, a particular service, right, mm -hmm. to Kubernetes, is, are you using something like Helm to do that, or is um, it like custom for you guys, like direct interactions with mm -hmm. like the CRDs? Yes, um, people are doing uh, all kind of things. We have teams that just write plain YAML and do manual kubectl. Got it. We have teams writing YAML and using the CI CD to deploy to Kubernetes. Right. We have uh, teams that using YAML, uh, not YAML, Helm, yeah. to uh, template stuff and deploy into the cluster. We don't run the tiller. They use only Helm to generate the YAML. Right. Don't use tiller. Right. <laughs> don't use it. <laughs> that's, that's going away in Helm. Yes, exactly, but don't use how to interact with, uh, I have a, a bad story about that one. <laughs> <laughs> we wiped the cluster uh, no, no, no. <laughs> last year after having onboarded two teams mm. with Helm. No, don't use Helm. <laughs> so use only Helm to generate templates sure. and then you check this. I have a team that does a mixture of Terraform. There is a uh, Terraform provider to sure. interact with Kubernetes. Yeah. And he uses Terraform to get stuff from other things, put them into uh, values and, and configuration, put them into Kubernetes, and then get the Kubernetes result out back into his Terraform and his Amazon account to do other right. stuff. I don't, yeah. So it's, um, as I said, our teams have the autonomy to decide how they want to work and how they want to interact. We just point them to the API and you have your credentials. Do you use them manually or with the CI CD or with this? It's up to them. But after a while, they realize that, yeah, perhaps <laughs> doing everything manually is not that good. And then they move on to the stuff that we have provided and then they can use the highway, the paved road to be just more productive. Good. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yep. It was a pleasure to be here to find this place and to listen to some of the other talks. And now I will go to do some sightseeing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Good. Thanks. For Thanks. Wait, I need to do it. Sure. Always do this. Right. You will not end up on uh, on the internet. <laughs> Good, cool. It's just for memory reasons. Sure. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much for volunteering by yourself and coming yes. over. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just... Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I think uh, before closing it off, like the usual stuff, like uh, we have a formal uh, thing to close. How many folks are first time coming for the meetup here? Oh, that's a good number. Nice. So uh, this is just to give you an uh, understanding of like what we have so that like you could uh, join the other things as well as like you could help us with the team as well. So the first thing is, uh, this is actually 42nd meetup. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's running. Oh. It's been running from like from current like Red Hat folks, Baiju, like a lot of people's organized, and then we ended up going now. But anyways, so I think most of you uh, knew the information from Meetup.com. So if you haven't really joined Meetup.com, please do join. So in Meetup, there is a Golang Bangalore, Bangalore channel, and this is our main source of posting events. Uh, so we post it here. And the second thing is, uh, if you haven't really joined uh, Slack, please do join uh, Slack. Uh, there is a Bangalore Slack channel. Uh, which you keep getting updates like our Zoom links, our recordings, and other things, as well as you can ask any questions because pretty much all of us is available in Bangalore channel as well. Uh, now the second part is uh, this meetup is actually organized in uh, every month uh, and like we host it in different places. So we invite uh, you to also come and speak because your experience like you would be working very different interesting things. So please do uh, like ping in Bangalore Slack channel or meetup or come and talk to us. So that now we have a pipeline of talks and then we can schedule our talks later. Um, so please do uh, come and talk to us about it. And uh, so join Slack channel and there is also a Twitter handle. Like we're not, uh, what do you call that? Like posting it regularly, but eventually we'll yeah, sort of automate it. Um, that's go, go Bangalore. Uh, that is the, uh, you know, yeah, Twitter account. And Re, like a, a while back, apart from the meetup, uh, we sort of figured out that like, you know, there is plenty of people uh, who couldn't join the actual event. And also there's a lot of people in other cities uh, who wants to learn about Golang and then who are very like, they're, they're a minority in the community, but still they have to benefit in the meetups, right? So Bangalore has good turnouts and also like, I think Hyderabad, I'm, I'm not sure. Like the numbers are good in Bangalore, but we thought, you know what, like we'll do a remote study group. So that way, you know, all of us could join from all other cities and as well as like you could talk, get speakers from other places as well. Um, so this is happening every fortnight. Uh, we do this uh, on Thursday, every Thursdays. Uh, I mean, every fortnight Thursdays, uh, 8.30 p.m. Uh, this is actually a spin-off from uh, uh, Arshilas, right? Like Ars Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Like they have a, they had a meetup and then like study group. And then we started uh, doing something similar. So that you could find the link in Golang India. So this is the organization we have in GitHub. Pretty much what we are doing, uh, we have it in study group. Uh, we even have a site up and like we are trying to bring up a site, like a lot of volunteers are helping with that. So this meetup has all the uh, sessions we had till now. And also the recordings we uploaded in the uh, YouTube. Uh, we have around like what uh, some good number of videos. Uh, so Golang India. YouTube, please do check it out. Even this, whatever we have recorded, uh, we'll actually post it in the YouTube. Um, so that's a remote study group. And then if you want to submit a talk, uh, please do open an issue here so that we can schedule your talk in the upcoming sessions. Um, so this is like very beginner friendly or like you can talk about anything. Like it's not very restricted to some things. I think beginners, you could use this as a forum to come and talk. Uh, so please do reach out to us or ping in Slack channel. There is also uh, go study group India, uh, which is a channel dedicated for this. So bunch of us uh, talk here and then we figure out what to uh, talk and then who's posting and stuff like that. Uh, so having said that, like, uh, this is all the links, like, uh, in Twitter, I think I mentioned, there is also, uh, this thing. Yeah. Let's see. So this is the, like other study group, uh, in us. And then this is our study group. Uh, we've added here. Uh, this is the two groups running as of now. Um, cool. Sorry. Okay. So apart from that, uh, before mentioning, I think we're looking for two things. One is sponsors all always, uh, because, because of sponsorship, we were able to get some things like example, if not for zoom, we couldn't have had videos in YouTube. Uh, like example, we could have had like Mike or we could get some books, mementos, whatever. Like we have this list in the GitHub. Uh, if your company is looking for, uh, to sponsoring the meetup, uh, please do let us know apart from hosting the, uh, event, uh, this list is available in GitHub so you can reach out to us. So this is actually helpful for the community. Uh, please do check it out. And second thing is, uh, volunteering, uh, let's go here. So before going into the list, uh, actually I have to thank like a lot of volunteers, Ankur, Praveen, uh, Karan, like the beginning stage, he has been there from a long time. And then he'd been paying meetup account for like really long time. No, I stopped this month, right? Because yeah, yeah. Part of the pro yeah. meetup pro, which is yeah. really cool. So yeah, other cities, I think people were asking about the meetup. Like I think now they can easily create a meetup and yeah, Dinesh, me. So, and then Driti, Baiju, all of the folks from the past and, uh, 
one more mention is uh, we recently got a, a logo design for us uh, which is actually created by uh, ashley so we also thank her and then we thank simple uh, senthil and like the other volunteers here for the venue and the snacks and stuff so that's the official mention <laughs> so but on an important note uh, we look for volunteers because recently there is a good number of people turning up for volunteering and because of which we are able to put up the site uh, we were able to put up the videos and then we are also working on uh, some site uncles leading that and then we are having a trello board we are figuring out how to build things like i have like i've been thinking of automating all this organizing stuff so that it's become simpler yeah. uh, so all this like we have sort of a collection of things what we want to do so a uh, lot of people come and volunteer so we're just letting you know so that you could help in different ways as well apart from talking and then uh, coming to the meetup um, so please do come and talk to us about it and if there is any questions please ping us in bangalore uh, i'm available and dinesh kumar ankur karan uh, you can reach out to us and thank you so so much for coming and if there is anything else you could talk now officially yeah. we are closed yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome thank you what do you do yes <laughs> if you have any questions or anything uh, it could be technical or we could even divulge that's yeah. totally fine i think we can chill, uh, like network for some time and then we can be So, who wants to be speaker next time? Like, give talks. Like, we we're gonna build a pipeline because there is enough people interested. In. I like the idea of speaking issues. Yeah. There are some people who build a pipeline. Otherwise, it's very ad hoc.